We are the University of Bedfordshire, where groundbreakers take risks, where future leaders make their mark, where high flyers soar. Get the support and opportunities to achieve more, become more, defy expectations. Find out how a degree at Bedfordshire can change your life. Book now for our open day on November 21st at beds.ac.uk slash defy. And welcome to another edition of the Paranormal Concept Show. I'm your host, Paul Rook, and as always, we are joined by the stupendous Kerry Greenway and the stupendous Richard Clements. Hello. Hello, guys. Hello. 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 So how have you been this week, Kerry? Yes, I've been very good this week. I've still got my snotty aftermath going on. Ugh. I know, right? This is great. I'm loving this. Yeah, I've still got that going on. But apart from that, yeah, it's been a good week. I go back to my day job on Monday, though. Get freedom of choice for your small business with the new Amazon Business American Express card. Flexibly choose between 60-day payment terms or 1.5% Amazon rewards points on eligible Amazon UK purchases only. Make the best payment choice to suit your cash flow. Your business. Your rules. Your Amazon Business American Express card. Apply now. Get a £25 Amazon gift card on approval at amazon.co.uk forward slash Amex card application. Terms apply. Representative 32.6% APR variable. Subject to approval aged 18 plus. Summer holiday is over. Boo! (laughs) Yes. I think the summer ended a long time ago. It's funny, really. You know, you sort of, it's quite nice. And then this last week, uh, the weather's gone to hell in a handbasket. I mean, it's so certainly kept me in <laughs> same here i've literally had two weeks it. where i've done nothing like outside the home obviously i've done stuff Terrible. indoors but nothing like outside the home it's, it's certainly a a social social cull when it rains constantly for two <laughs> weeks isn't it we had plans and everything to do a road trip and we weren't able to oh, do that all sorts didn't we oh yeah, dear oh mind. well never mind so richard what have you been up to this week well, as I sort of just reiterated, uh, not a lot really. I'm I'm pondering my blog, which I will get down to. Don't worry, Paul. I'll get down and do that tomorrow. And uh, fantastic. <laughs> and th- there is a new blog out as well this week. Mm. Oh yes, well, I saw not that this week, but just gone. Finally, just gone. Yeah. Uh, yeah Mysteries of the mind. That came out of yeah. a bad dream I had. Because the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about um, ufology, haven't we? We've been dipping our toe in the ufology world with Christopher Rice, (laughs) and um, then we had Malcolm Robinson on last week, and it's all very ufo-y, and I have an anxiety dream, which occurs, reoccurs. I know where it's come from. It's come from a childhood trauma of War of the Worlds. I know exactly where it's come from. (laughs) Basically, it's aliens have taken over the world, and I'm trying to get my family out, and, and it's just all horrific and horrible, right? And that's my dream anyway. So when I approached this blog, it was like a night where I'd woken up in a cold sweat from this anxiety dream that I have. And um, it led me down the path of Morpheus, um, which was a a Greek god. It's just absolutely fascinating. So go and have a little read because that was come off the back of a nightmare. Um, Because of this topic that Paul keeps dragging us down to talk about, (laughs) which is the ufology world. And we're not doing anything really different tonight because we're going to have a look at another another aspect of it really aren't we lads we are you know we, we thought you know we, with the ufos we've done done the unidentified flying objects but i thought with 71 percent of the uh, surface covered by water there's a lot of activity with submerged unidentified submerged objects so i thought rather than doing the skies we'll we'll do underwater this week hmm because there's a lot of stuff going on under the water well, for the last few weeks. There <laughs> is. No, you're right. There is. And you are right with the amount of water there is on Earth. It's one of the most unexplored areas, isn't it, they say? Well, well it's, it's, it's a bit damp. 
<laughs> you need a good coat. Yeah, um, your wellies. <laughs> and well, wellies. <laughs> and it's always the old, the old adage that comes out. They always say we know less about the depths of the ocean than what we do about space. You know, so there's still quite a bit to explore down there. Do you know what? A kayak would be really handy as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, this is a plan we've got, but we've put it on hold until next summer. Um, that Paul's alluding to there. <laughs> yeah, Paul doesn't want to do this, though, I would just like to add. Um, no, I've, I've got a bit of sense. <laughs> <laughs> I just think I've, it would be such fun. <laughs> I've got plans for my kayak, don't you worry. Yeah, we've got plans with our kayaks, haven't we, Richard? Yeah. <laughs> That's oh. a good one. <laughs> how many how many of you have actually got sailing experience? No, none. None really. Well we'll but... get we'll get it, Paul. We'll get it. I've I've got experience. I used to go sailing quite a lot. But well, I don't fancy to... going out in a kayak. Well you'll give us some <laughs> handy hints then, won't you? Yeah, yeah. that's it. I'll, I'll let you go I'll get I'll let you go on the kayak and I'll just take my um, eight berth sailing yacht. <laughs> you can instruct us from the riverbank, Paul. Yeah, you just sit there and say, "No, no, you're doing it wrong." From the riverbank, from one of the, the <laughs> no, it'd be, a, it'd be a case of me me floating there with the anchor down and me sitting there, feet up, um, on the side of the boat, beer in one hand. Lucy, on the, Lucy steering the boat because you know, and, and then you stuck on the land and uh, uh, stuck on like a little island somewhere. And I go, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, back to you, Sos. It is one of the most unexplored areas, um, the oceans um, of the world are, and there are lots and lots of accounts of unidentified objects, um, not just um, ufology world, but you know archaeologically as well so we thought we'd take another delve into the depths um away from animals this time though we're not we're not we've done the animal side of it with the kraken and stuff like that yeah, we've yeah. done that yeah. one so we have but even that shows how unexplored you know how unexplored it is you know these giant squids are a thing um and they've only been observed once i think it was we found out wasn't it that you know yeah. in the previous show so it shows that there's a lot we don't know that lurk beneath the waves. Now, basically, the ufology world first took the world by storm in, in you know, the early 1900s, wasn't it, really? Mm-hmm. <coughs> oh, sorry, excuse me. Now, a private pilot in 1947 first reported nine objects skimming across the water at Washington State in America. But there are earlier reports than that. Which I actually found really yeah, fascinating. They, I, I did, actually. I mean, the, the, some of the early reports go back to 1639. Uh-huh. Maybe Richard could elaborate. Well, yeah, 1639, and it is uh, with the... Uh, well, there was uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony co-founder, uh, Governor John... John Winfort recorded a second-hand observation, so he didn't actually sort of see this of an unidentified job object in the skies over Boston. Uh, but, uh, however, uh, due to the rather vague sort of an, um, verifications, it was difficult to actually get a translation from his actual sort of um, original uh, transcript of the event. But uh, but since then, there have been a sort of like a, a plethora, I, I would say. <laughs> I do. <laughs> of sightings worldwide of the phenomena of U- USOs. Mm. Yeah. Now, there is that crossover, though, isn't there, between, like, you know, we are quite often you'll hear of a UFO account and then that disappeared beneath the waves or vice versa, you know, something was seen beneath the waves and then seemed mm. to, to take off. So there is a crossover, and I think this is why it mm. buys so much into the same phenomena rather than looking at maybe a more rational explanation. Now, the first ever account I found was in nine, is in 1492, um, which was actually a Christopher Columbus account, which I actually found quite fascinating, uh, because this is supposed to have been reported in his actual journal, although the pages of this particular journal have gone missing. So it's actually second-hand accounts from what they read in his journal mm. originally, if that makes sense. So Yeah. Okay. Now, so, yeah, someone snooped, found what they wanted to. <laughs> yeah. 
stole the pages, and then someone said, oh, yeah, I remember reading that in the in, in Christopher's diary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good old Christopher. But on this one, I don't know. I think this one's, again, it's, is it down to translation on this one? Because from what we would say now to what is described is very different. Yeah, it is a, it is a sort of odd one, but I think it is sort of like explainable because it came towards the end of his sort of like first voyage and uh, they were, they would have been quite within the sort of bounds of the Caribbean islands, you know, because he actually made and touched down in one of the Caribbean islands. So I think it quite possibly could have been uh, some sort of sighting of a land light of some sort, as opposed to actually something from the sea, if they actually saw anything. Because again, as you alluded to, Kerry, this is a second-hand account. There is no original source to go on. No, they, no, exactly. So this is... But then I suppose if you see the light... And he didn't know what it was. Technically, it is a UFO, or unidentified object at least. Well, yes. And if he did actually see this, yes, and he didn't know and what it was, yeah, it's unidentified. Yeah, because it's only a UFO until someone goes, oh, yeah, that's like the new boat mm. 737 or whatever. <laughs> You know, yeah, because they wouldn't have oh, had any yeah, reference. Yeah, it is. It's not yeah. UFO. So it was obviously, and if it did ha- and happen, it was obviously noteworthy so to say, it was put in the log. Mm. So, yeah. Well, it was obviously something he'd not come across before. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? For him to put it in his log. But this was this all happened just before landing on the Guanahana. Yeah. Uh, island of, of there. <laughs> the Guanahana, uh, yes. Yeah, whatever uh, that is. Well, we left that one for you, Kerry. I know. There, yeah, there's going to be a lot of words in this that they're going to leave for me. I would just like to point that out. Um, now, Columbus allegedly described the light as a small wax candle that rose and lifted up, which to few seemed to be an indication of land. And this is just say so this was just before they hit that island. So was it something on one of the islands that he saw, or was it not? I mean, we 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 don't know. Um, they've looked at, you know, from from what they know of the log, they've looked at where it should have been in relation to the land, and say it wasn't on the land. Mm-hmm. They've sort of like worked out that quite possibly the closest landfall, you know, they've done their sort of maths and stuff, was probably about 35 miles away. So, yeah. And these islands were inhabited. Yeah. See, I'm assuming that he was on his ship. Yeah. He was on his ship, yeah. So could it have just been a native on the island warning the tribes people by an arrow flare to say there's a ship coming? (laughs) Well, it's a pos- it's a possibility. We don't know. Um, or there's a UFO over the sea. Look, <laughs> yeah, yeah look, there's a U- they're going. There's a UFO out there. You know, what's yeah. that light out in the ocean? It, it <laughs> seems quite benign. You know, it's nothing sort of from the description. It's quite mundane, isn't it? It's not as sort of fantastic as some of the later sort of uh, the more modern sort of sightings when they see things darting at hundreds of miles an hour. It just seems like a light. More or less floating there, appears to rise slightly, fall, fall slightly perhaps, mm. and uh, they describe it as a candle, a yeah. flame, mm-hmm. you know. So these would have been, they are see, they do seem to be familiar of what it might be, you know, a candle, that's a flame. But that's you know. within their frame of reference, Richard. Mm. Because they wouldn't yeah. have an electrical, yeah. you know, they wouldn't have known anything about that. It would mm. only have been a light, would have been either... Uh, meteorological, so coming yeah. from the sky, candle, flame, mm-hmm. that's, and that's within their frame of reference. So that's the only <clears> way they could describe it is within their frame of reference. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what I mean? So that, to me, indicates it's not very bright. I mean, a candle yeah. viewed 35, say 35 miles away, that's that's got to be stronger than candle, quite frankly. Mm-hmm. It. <laughs> Yeah, to me, I mean, it does sound like perhaps a fire on a coast or something like that, you know, a campfire or stuff. It, mm, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to chance the arm and put it much more than that, you know. I very much doubt it's the men from Alta Centauri or somewhere like that. Well, as I say, they've done their maths and it, they look like it was thirty-five miles or you know, um, away from San Salvador 
which is Watling mm. Island. Um, they think it, it was offshore. They don't think it was on land. Yeah. But because we haven't got the exact log, who knows, right? It's done from memory. Well, it's it, it, it's it, one yeah, of those. To actually or, log one day and see what it actually said. Mm. Or it exactly. might have been native uh, fishermen out fishing. It could yeah. possibly be. I mean, they used mm. resins rather than um, mm. wax, um, yeah. which they do burn bright, resins, is what I would yeah. say. Um, now, another theory was bioluminescence on the rocks, um, which we know can be very bright at night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They can be quite... And there's another thing called a Bermuda fireworm, but apparently they only do this two days past the full moon. Um, yeah. And the moon was supposed to have been at full first quarter. Um, so that wouldn't have worked, basically. That theory sort of like is about because the way the Bermuda fireworms work. I don't, know, don't ask me, but I don't know what a Bermuda <laughs> yeah. fireworm is. But, you know, <laughs> it's one of those. But it's interesting. It's just an interesting account that they saw something that they yeah. hadn't explained. I mean, it could be this particular account for Christopher Columbus could be just very benign, very right. rational explanation. I mean, they're, don't forget, they're in waters that they're not au fait with. You know, they're just discovering no. these islands. They don't know what the natives are like. They don't know what they do. And they're, we, there's a lot that's not explained in that. It basically mm -hmm. just says they saw a light that looked like a candle that went up and down, which if it's on the sea on a boat, it kind of would, wouldn't it? It would go up and down with yeah. the waves. So it could just be something very benign. But it's interesting that it was um, put out there as the first ever account of a USO. Um, mm -hmm. And how and I, uh, how the ufology world take these accounts and read a lot into it, quite frankly. Well, <clears throat> I think they've taken it and just used it as a jumping off point like we have for the show for this subject. You know, you, yeah, I you, think people actually... like... Do you actually have like a, a transcript of mm. what this log is supposed to be? Because like I know that there's um, a log that's been abstracted from other various logs. Right. Well, it was put yes. in. It was put in Ferdinand Columbus Vita del Amaraglio. <laughs> But basically, the life of an admiral. This is where he's trying to get me to say. I've been trying to avoid it through the whole the whole time. This is the only thing he wanted me to say. Oh, um, <laughs> the pregnant pause there. It was put in there. I had to build myself up for that one. Um, and some other sources. So it has been put out there as from Christopher Columbus's. But I say the original <clears throat> account is actually missing from the log. From the actual mm. log, it's actually missing. So it could be bunkum, for all we know. I don't yeah. know. It's all I could find on it, really. But I d it was always linked to ufology, though. That was the interesting thing. When I came across it, it wasn't anything to do with maritime law or, you know, anything to do with that. It was all always under a ufology link. So mm. it is something that the that world have taken as, like, the first ever account. And... Um, I kind of think it's a reach. I think, kind of think it's a reach, a, a, a confirmation bias for this hasn't just been happening recently. This has been happening for a long, long time. A bit like when you see the, you know, like the big stained glass windows of the, yeah. you know, the Virgin Mary and then there's something mm. in the sky or, you know, the account of Jesus' birth and it wasn't a star, it was a UFO. You know what I mean? It's almost like yeah. things like that. And I think this people, is another case of that. People tend to want to give their subject, because they're passionate about it, they believe in it, they want to give it some sort of provenance, some sort of history. You know, but it may is. well have. We don't know. Mm. So there's a lot of things we don't know. We will assume there's probably a rational explanation for that. A yeah. ufologist from that perspective may look at it and go, well, actually, we, it, it's not evidence, but it's, <coughs> it's an indicator mm -hmm. that maybe yeah. something was going on. You know, in the, in the same way as when we look at old paranormal cases, we were talking about cold cases the other week, weren't we? And saying, yeah. like, when you get the alpha case, an old case and you're trying to research it, it's so difficult because people have passed away or the building's not the same as it was or records have been lost through wars or, you know, fires or whatever. It's so difficult to, to find the 
the evidence you need linked to a case. And these are the same. I mean, unless we find that the log details of Christopher Columbus, you know, the the alpha case, the alpha point, we can only go, uh, make assumptions on that. Well, and, that's it. You know, <clears throat> and maybe possibly something was happening that was unexplained. And because we're we're um, more advanced in technology, you know, his description of what he could have seen would still be um, very open to interpretation yeah. because of our knowledge. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, what might have been unexplained to him might not necessarily be unexplained to us. Um, but I, I do, for the, for the next part of um, the, the next case that we're going to be discussing, I know Richard's got a very soft... Um, soft spot for places with embarrassing names. <laughs> so I thought, you know, Rich might want to explain about Shag Harbour. Uh, well, not really, but... <laughs> <laughs> Shag Harbour in Canada, oh dear. Well, you might have to help me out on this down, one. Do you know what? It's just down the coast a bit from Oak Island. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no wonder how quickly into the show you'd get that one in. Oh, dear. <laughs> He managed to make well, 19 and a half up. minutes, Richard. Yeah, that's right. I saw that actually coming up. But uh, shall we try and tackle this one then? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a really well. interesting case, actually. And, and it's something that's still um, explored today. They have festivals about this and stuff like that. So, you mm. know, like conferences and stuff like that, actually at Shag Harbour. So, and this is something that's really prevalent in the memory of people who are still alive who experience mm. this. And they're, they're still in that point of, I don't know what it was. I don't know what happened that night. Do you know what I mean? It's it's still a, one of those um, scenarios where you know something happened but you, and you were involved with that because, but you don't quite understand what happened, if you know what I mean. So anyway, let's have a look at the case, Richard. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> on the night of October the 4th, uh, 1967, a handful of local rep- a uh, resident saw a low-flying, brightly lit object head towards Shag Harbour before it quickly crashed into the sea. Where it sank before anyone could get to it... Well, I'm sorry, it sank before anyone could actually get to it. And uh, poor, and the first reports to the RM... Uh, no, to the RCMP, which is, I believe, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police was a lot of people actually believed this was an actual plane crash. And uh, the, uh, so, uh, hang on, let's go down here. <clears throat> oh, hang on. So, yeah, the plane crashed, um, and it was witnessed, wasn't it, by Laurie Wickens or something? Wickens. Laurie Wickens. Wickens. She was the, one of the first key witnesses to this case. Um, she actually found, she was people that found the RCMP, um, to report it, but they didn't really believe her. So she just hung up. She thought, oh, well, if you're not going to believe me, they're fine, right? But they, because of the way the police run out there, they phoned the phone booth back and said, where? Where are you? We're going to meet you. Where are you? We need to find it. You know, we need to look at this. And um, so, yeah, that's what happened for her. She phoned it in. She was the one who saw it go into the sea. But they did but think it was a plane crash. That that was the initial thought. Was you know, oh my mm. god, you know, we've just well, had a plane it, cause, crash. Because normal people jump to the conclusion that it is a plane. Mm. You exactly. know, they they just see they just see this hunk of metal flying towards the the ground or the sea in this case, and hit it. So even if, even if it was a UFO and it crashed on land, people would assume it's a plane you know, or something. Plane. Yeah. Nowadays, because that's what we see in the sky and whatever naturally, anyway. So, from their vantage point, though, they could see the light drifting in the water Mm. and they kept watching. They were obviously not in a position where they could get down to it, so they they were watching this light floating in the water or drifting in the water and Mm. then it just went out. But the interesting sort of thing about this is what's actually uh, observed from a different perspective, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, from a cargo plane. Mm. So yeah, traveling from New York to to London, and uh, I sort of, uh, <clears throat> I mean, because the pilots were just 
just happened to be looking in the right direction and saw the for, uh, a formation of bluish white lights slanting from the upper left to the lower right. And they said, oh, watch this guy. <laughs> I should imagine he did. Yeah. But the thing is, uh, they sort of contacted the, the local uh, air traffic control and uh, sort of said, and do you see and what we're seeing? And uh, they said, no, it wasn't actually tracked on radar. They they had this aircraft on radar, but not they had their aircraft on radar, but not allegedly what was in the area at the time. That that is what makes that is interesting though, isn't it? Is it like well, no, there's nobody on the radars, and they're going well. We're looking, yeah. we're looking at it. It's yeah. there. Do you know what I mean? You can imagine the frustration. Um, but two, the two people, yeah, because in... they said it looked like they, they reckon it looked like a B fifty two or a seven oh seven. Yeah, which that's is not small. quite large. Yeah, that's not small. Yeah, mm. yeah. I mean, I'm 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 assuming it's. Like the Boeing seven oh seven, as opposed to a yeah, uh, it's a yeah. jumbo jet. Yeah, yeah, which is quite a large uh, object. <clears throat> yeah, know, they like, said all with the all lights, its lights but... are on. Yeah, I mean the and the the thing is, they both reacted. You know, there's three people in the cockpit, and two people reacted to go and actually take control because they thought they would have to, you know, take like maneuver around it because it was coming at them. Yeah, because, mm. well, and as it says here, I mean, their first reaction of, of both the pilot and the co-pilot was to grab the yokes of the aircraft, mm-hmm. you know, ready to do an evasive manoeuvre. So, you know, just that alone suggests that, you know, they were observing something which, you know, caused them alarm at exactly. the very yeah. least. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, Norman Smith was a teenager in Shag Harbour, and on the night of the incident, he saw lights in the sky, then followed them until they crashed into the water. He and his father and his uncle hopped into a fishing boat on an immediate rescue mission because they thought it was a plane that had crashed into the harbour. Yeah. You know, so yeah, that, that's exactly what they're doing. They're going, oh, my God, this is a plane crash. Quick, you know, we've got to get out there to these people. Yeah, I you think know? that's pretty much of a standard response, really, isn't it? I mean, look at the um, plane crash they had in... Um, Oh, was it Hudson? The Hudson River? Yeah. Not yeah. Ago. You know, you, you had um, the, the New York ferries come over, all like local fishing boats and other, you know, just public, members of the public with boats. Yeah. They just flocked towards the crash, you know, saving as many people as they could. And obviously everyone got out, which yeah. is quite lucky. I mean, the whole thing was lucky, but... You know that that's sort of like the new normal human response to go and help. I think so. When so. they see what they thought was a plane crash, they yeah obviously jumped in their boats and went to help. Yeah, I think it is a normal. You see something like that happen, your new it is it's one of your first responses. What can I do? Can I help? <coughs> You know. Yeah, because he actually went out there in the boat and he actually went to the actual crash site and uh, he was actually quite surprised there was no actual debris because uh, from the account he was quite he was expecting to find people, bodies and and wreckage. But it is funny there was actually something left behind, but it was just a, a residue of a sort of like a a yellowish sort of orange foam. So it, it certainly indicates there was something that either hit the water or sort of went into it or it hovered above well. it. When you mm. think, he said it was four to six inches thick on the water. So something hit, something caused that. But I would play devil's advocate on that because mm-hmm. you can get, foam can get made by the ocean. We've seen pictures of sea well, foam yeah. and stuff like that. That's normally over a larger period you know like a larger expanse though to be fair not just localized um, in the area but that's what they found and but, yeah yeah well i sort of still think i mean even the next day they were still pretty much convinced the plane had gone down yeah i mean because they actually sent divers you know so this has got all the hallmarks of you know uh there was people gathering and everything i mean a lot of people actually saw this yeah happen. Yeah, and you've got people from different vantage points that are seeing this, from people in the sky to people in the harbour to people up on the cliff tops. You know, I mean, you've got people in various, you know, positions watching this happen. And the interesting thing is, and I, 
very rarely does a plane crash in water where it doesn't leave some form of debris, even if it's oil residue or something like that. Not <coughs> a foam, I would say. Yeah, that. maybe that's what fueled the craft then, isn't it? You know, if, if whatever fueled the craft, because, I mean, if it's going to be an alien um, object, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to use the same fuels that we do. Well, well that's... That's assuming it was an alien object. I mean, you're sort of like going with the premise that uh, all UFOs, USOs are alien spacecraft, nuts and bolts. Well, okay, maybe not alien as in, you know, Mm. aliens from space, but, you know, someone, at least, has created this craft that wouldn't necessarily run on the same (coughs) that we use whether it's an alien as in space or whether it's alien from another country sort of thing. Mm-hmm. It's alien, you know? They yeah. Know, one thing's for sure is they know something landed in the water. Yeah. They don't yeah. know I, what it I is. They can't deny that. They won't... Of all, exactly. Of they all. won't put... Even the people that witnessed it won't say, oh, it was a UFO. They know mm. something came down out of the sky and landed in the water. They don't know what it was. They acknowledge they probably never will. Um, Because, you know, and this wasn't just forgotten about. They had the RCMP, the Canadian Coast Guard, the Royal Canadian Navy, fishing boats, over days looking for debris or evidence of the plane or something that they know landed in the harbour. Found nothing. Mm. Found Well, Uh, nothing that they have admitted to anyway. Well, that's (laughs) it. I mean, even... um... The skipper of the Coast Guard, uh, Captain Ronnie Newell, mm. um, he was um, on board the Coast Guard Cutter 101. Then he said they mobilised within 10 minutes. So yeah. if this object has crashed into the into the sea, I mean, that they, they didn't find anything under the water either, did they? No, no, they didn't. They dived so, out. Well, so yeah. so in, in 10 minutes, it literally crashed into the sea flew off or carried on going so <laughs> did it actually crash or did it dive into the sea for a reason and then just carry on going under like a submarine type thing well, uh, well i think that's something we'll never know will we no i mean after five days they stopped all the searching and everything but else. that that's that's a logical uh, a not a logical um reasoning to it that it, it did it, it was flying at one point obviously mm. dived into the sea and because no one see it rise up again in that 10 minutes it's stayed under the sea it's not an unreasonable assumption to make that it, it went off like a submarine under the sea mm. so no one knows obviously no one see it rise but they- yeah, but they couldn't actually sort of find it because what you've got to remember is uh, this happened, uh, and by the looks of it, relatively close to land as well, sort of in a harbour. They're shallow, they're sheltered, and uh, the locals would know pretty much what's down there, you know, because it, you know, and they had divers down there, so that sort of indicates that uh, at its deepest point, it couldn't be no more than what a hundred, a hundred feet deep. Mm. I think that's the problem still, still with this... It might be deep enough to cover it. Yeah, you don't yeah. know, do you? I mean, the other thing I would say is that's added to the mystery of this that, again, is linked time and time again to the ufology world, and we link it into conspiracy theory, was that about 30 minutes away, there's a United States military base, which, you know, secret, <coughs> a secret US base, um, which was monitoring Not subterranean reason. and underwater frequencies um, to do it's with the fair. Russian... Huh? It's not there. It's not there, really, no. No, it's not there, no. <laughs> but that because it's only 30 minutes away from this situation, they've automatically linked it. It might not be anything to do with that. It could be a completely separate incident. Um, yeah. But people were still diving in the, uh, in the harbour to this day, and a diver, David Savette, um, has actually been surveying the ocean floor of the harbour for years. He reckons he's claimed um, to discover underwater anomalies and depressions in the area where the crash is said to have taken place. Um, he think, What he says is they're like a depression of a dinner plate, mm. with the centre being about a foot deep, perfectly round, and covering the depression was pebbles two to four centimetres in size. 
So we say, well, so where are the big rocks? Where are the plants? Where are the, you know, where's the flora and the fauna of the, mm. you know, where is it? Because it was, it was absolutely clear. It was like nothing. After all these years. I mean, it would, it, would it not depend on the current? I have no idea. But you would expect to find some form of erosion under the ocean because of the current. Yeah. Silt or something. It, yeah, it could have eroded everything and just, I don't know, but he said it's so like, creating a Grand Canyon type thing. He says <laughs> that this perfect circle with these stones were like they had happened like yesterday. Yeah. But unless you'd seen that for yourself, then who knows? It could just be. I mean, I don't well, know. I could only find one account of one diver since that's been down there, which was this David Svet. Um, maybe there's been more, but I couldn't find any on my quick research on this one. So yeah. it could be. I don't know, I'm not going to say it, but you've got to just take his word for it, right? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it is an interesting case, I will say that, of all the sort of like ones we sort of come across in our sort of brief sort of like lookovers and stuff. This is, you know, something certainly happened. I mean, you know, certainly the build-up to the case and the build-up to the sighting, you know, something certainly happened, which is unexplainable. Yeah. Yeah, I, is, I think we're going to have to put this one down like the old Rendersham um, yeah. UFO. You know, either someone was fibbing or it actually happened. I think you've got <laughs> that, too that was many. A conclusion. That think, was a conclusion for Rendlesham. Yeah, but I think you've got too many different vantage points of witness mm-hmm. to say that they were all lying. And there, there's no denying that the research and rescue mission did go ahead. So something happened yeah. that night. Whether or not... Um, you know, it was a military exercise and they've covered that up. Who knows? It's one of those things that will forever be a mystery, I feel. Absolutely, I think yeah. so. Now, talking of, like, you know, the services being involved, there's none so more as the Sonja Ford in Norway. This happened in 1972. Now, this 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 particular Ford is um, the largest in the world it's a massive mm-hmm. massive body of water it runs 127 miles and has a maximum depth depth even god i can't get my words right tonight <laughs> 4291 feet and it's inland so this is a massive yeah. body of in, inland water in norway um and it, it's surrounded by cliffs of 3300 feet or more it's a beautiful area. I'm not going to deny it. This is an absolutely beautiful area. Oh, so Nor- yeah. Norway is, I, I think Norway is, to be fair. Yeah, especially along the coast and up north yeah. and um, with the fjords. Yeah, fjords, it's quite yeah. as uh, spectacular. Yeah. But not particularly forgiving in regards no. to if you get in trouble in a fjord, then you're kind of in trouble, right? <laughs> but this this happened with allegedly. <clears throat> the Norwegian Navy and some NATO forces. Now, they were involved in a two-week-long observation, apparently in pursuit of a USO, and it started in November the 12th through to November the 22nd in 1972. They reckon in all there was about 30 naval vessels that participated in the search of the Sonja Ford. I don't know if I'm saying that right at all, but we'll go with the <laughs> Sonja Ford. Fjord, <laughs> Now, some, they're not, not, we're not quite sure how it all started, but this is a time where, you know, <laughs> Russia's not always had the most peaceful history, shall we say. No. Well, they do push the boundaries to Russia. Well, yeah, I mean, I can certainly understand where they're coming from. You know, there would have been a lot of Russian activity around there, sort of with uh, their submarines and, well, U boat submarines, whatever you like to call them. You know, they there's, you know, I mean, and this is quite well documented as well. Mm-hmm. Well, they reckon they, they started with the sighting of a Russian new boat, which is a submarine, basically. Yeah. And that, yeah. um, and others, others say that it actually was flying and disappeared below the water. So we've got for straight away, straight off the bat there, we've got a, a kind of disagreement with how this started. Mm-hmm. It started off either as a Russian U-boat or it started as a UFO that then went onto the been, water. They could have been testing a new, new submarine. <laughs> could, could have, have done both. That could be both, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to see that. Well, now, you never know. Again, we have a lot of unidentified people 
in this um, because two unidentified witnesses reported seeing a bright object on the water. Now, most reports say that a fast-moving object was picked up. They reckon it was on radar. But again, these are facts that are not definite. It's like presumably on radar. Yeah. You know, it's like unidentified witnesses. And I, <coughs> when, when this, this is... It this always... is more like a traditional UFO story. Lots of sort of missing pieces, unlike the Shag Harbour one, which is quite definite. You know, you've got a lot of sort of stuff to go back on and yeah. sort of point out. But this one's getting to the more sort of standard UFO story. Yeah, and that always sends red bells and red flags for me. When, yeah. you know, we've got Are you lot... saying they're fibbing? I'm not. I'm just saying it's presumably, <laughs> allegedly, it's like, you know unidentified and this was supposed to happen but that was supposed to happen and what the hell's the truth in all of this and is it a big made up story who knows right it's it's like the norwegian navy that says they deployed 30 ships i very much doubt the norwegian navy have got 30 ships to deploy you know it's quite a small don't know (laughs) who knows at this time don't forget this is 1972 and it's in the cold war yeah who knows Right? It might have been fishing ships for all we know. I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, somewhere along the way, it entered the waters of the Sonnenfold, where the Navy began to track it. Now, <laughs> specialised sub-hunter helicopters even joined in. Right? I don't even know what one of those is. <laughs> uh, this, is this is a cat and mouse. This is a cat and mouse story. They are certainly chasing something around the field, and it is quite a big expanse of water. So, you know, presumably they think it's a submarine. That's what they're going for. Yeah. Right? And they think it's Russian. That's where yeah. we're at with this, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, now, these things have been seen in the fall, so this isn't unusual yeah. to them. So this is quite, you know, quite normal. Now, they try to force them to surface, but to this day or up to that day in 1972, they hadn't been able to. So Russia kind of has the edge on them, right? Mm. Yeah, the only way you can really force a sub to surface and is to actually deck charge it, you know, sort of drop explosives mm. close by and try and damage it if you want it to surface. And that probably could have caused quite a major incident, <laughs> Yeah, wow. regardless if it's in your waters or not. Well, the... the... <laughs> The radar and sonar tracking of this, this we call it a USO for argument's sake, <laughs> of this USO does remain a secret, obviously, state secret. Yeah. Um, but I think they soon learned it wasn't a Soviet submarine because it was seen at the surface of the water and described as a massive, silent, torpedo-shaped craft. The Navy did fire at it and then it dove into the water again. So they then fired depth charges at it to no avail. So they did. They did actually try to fire stuff at it. Bring it to the surface. Yeah, yeah. well, they was like, we don't know. That's definitely not Russian. It's not going to cause a a, a bit of a a political political furor. So let's sod it. Let's just fire at it. Let's see what it is. (laughs) Do you know what? Well, I pity poor aliens. If they are out there, they're going to come down here and the amount of countries, you know, that would actually fire on them... (laughs) Because they don't know what they are, is like unbelievable, isn't it? So well, I feel sorry for the old aliens. <laughs> <laughs> Cause an interstellar. War. We don't. We don't stand a chance. We're going to just be caught up in an interstellar war because uh-huh. someone somewhere is going to see an alien spaceship and shoot at it. We got no hope. Well, <laughs> no, we haven't. Not really, but. Mm. Hey ho! Hey ho! Yeah, that's the human race for you, babes. Do you know what I mean? If we don't want to get off, (laughs) they obviously, you know, presumed it was a threat for them to actually sort of, you know, fire on it. Yeah, well, if you don't, because they didn't know what it was, they they sort of acknowledged that it wasn't anything in again their frame of reference. So they thought, (laughs) right, well, we'll fire on it then. We need to see what this is. Now they. Decided to blockade the Ford or blockade the Ford. How do you say yeah. that word? Blockade? Fjord. A blockade the entrance, oh, yeah, the field. Yeah. Yeah. Because it goes more shallower there. It's easier to do in shallow water is to block something. Um, so if, if it had been something that they knew about, like technology mm-hmm. they knew about, it would, it would have been trapped. 
yeah if it was sort of like a purely underwater object like a submarine it, and if it needed to get out it would have had to like well obviously get out the entrance of the fjord and they're but and fjords are quite and they're like funnel shaped the mouths are actually quite narrow and they're very shallow because they have like a lip before you go over actually into the fjord itself this is my old geography school lesson coming out here <laughs> so it makes sense that uh Right, we will contain it in the field, and we will just put we'll just put picket ships along the entrance, and uh, anything trying to get out will have to get past the picket ships, and they will have to come relatively close to the surface mm. to get over the the hump that's at the front of the field. Yeah. Now it was seen, or they reckon this U boat thing was seen heading towards the Ford's southern tip. Now, five police officers saw it at Kiamsoy, which is an island thirty-one miles north of Kirk Jabo. Now, if it was the same object, it would have had to have travelled at 124 miles per hour. Right, at, at the time, nah, that ain't going to have happened. In fact, I don't think they even travel that fast underwater now, do they? Not really. I think, uh, weren't we sort of looking about the other night, I think the fastest sort of man-made thing to travel underwater is something like 200 miles an hour, which is quite astonishing in itself. You know, you think of the resistances of water you've got. You probably can travel faster at the closer you are to the surface, but down deep, you've got that added pressure as well. Yeah, yeah. you've got the resistance. Mm, yeah, there's a lot of resistance down there, you know, so generally things don't travel fast in water. Well, the That's fish... why it always amazes me that fish can live that down that far. But they're built they're only little. Yeah, they're only little itty bitty things. But Does that mean them, when they come up to the, if they ever come to the surface, they'd be bigger? No, they usually explode, oh, don't yeah. they? <laughs> I don't know. I don't Maybe know. Maybe they're aren't little because they're under pressure. So if you bring them up where there's not a lot of pressure, yeah. they expand. Mm. I don't know. And then if you take them right out, they go pop. <laughs> you really have got a weird sense of mind yeah. at times, haven't where's, you? <laughs> where's this going? <laughs> anyway, back to the Usos in the Ford. <laughs> That's why I'll, I'll have a blog on yeah, that. Yeah, have a little blog yeah, on okay, that. Right. Do a bit of research on that to satisfy yeah. that particular curiosity. <laughs> anyway, some frigate ships dropped mines on this Uso, the one that was seen by the island by the five police officers, and didn't mm-hmm. seem to have an effect, right? Now... The night of the 21st, four witnesses saw four rockets shooting from the water at Hermansverk. Hermansverk, I could say that one. Hermansverk? <laughs> the rockets were silent and looked like small red balls of light. And on the afternoon of the 22nd, the Navy fired an anti-submarine missile at the intruders. At that point, the water depth was 82 feet, so it would have caused a tremendous shock wave, which would, if it had been a submarine, yeah. severely damaged it and required it to surface. Nothing. Yeah, because the deeper the water, the shock wave would dispense, you know, the, the explosion. But if you do it in a confined area, if there was anything else, even sort of, you know, quite far away from it. But if it's shallow enough, it would cause damage. Well, apparently the craft that was being tracked was unscathed. But this is mm. in and out, isn't it? This is like, oh, well, they tracked it there, then they blocked off the fold, but then so-and-so saw it so many miles away down here, and so-and-so saw it over here, and they dropped depth charges on it, and then certain other people saw lights coming out of the fold at this place, and it's all over the over the show with very little detail of individual. Mm. There's no cohesion, if that no, makes sense. It's, That's what's uh, coming across to me with this account, is uh, there's no cohesion. No, it's all very bitty, isn't it? It seems like it's been cobbled together after the fact. Isn't it? There, people yeah. are trying to make a story from this, from probably something that possibly did happen, something a bit unusual, but probably not that sort of otherworldly. And uh, they've sort of grabbed this and sort of uh, done some digging and sort of like grabbing at some really vague sort of <laughs> other stories surrounding the area at the time. Or it is all linked, and it was something completely <clears throat> unexplainable because in the two week period of all this going on. There were reports of aircraft experiencing unexplained electrical problems, yellow and green <laughs> objects flying along the mountainside, Navy vessels registering sonar contact with something in the deep water, surveillance craft witnessed unidentified objects that executed breakneck manoeuvres, even during f- fierce storms. I mean, we're November, so it's not climate weather yeah. going on here. So this is a massive operation that ended up 
basically with nothing. They have nothing. They witnessed something on radar. They responded to it. Mm -hmm. Various things were seen around the place. They used, you know, charges and fired at it and God Mm -hmm. knows what to no avail. What was it? Who knows? It was Nessie's cousin. Maybe it was Nessie's cousin. Or an Again, <laughs> as I sort of spoke with Malcolm last week, uh, the Norwegian fields, I mean, lights in fields are sort of quite commonly reported. And again, I think this might be a geological phenomena as opposed to uh, actual sort of, uh, you know, sort of aerial phenomena or underwater phenomena. I think there's something happening in the geology of the area that causes this yeah, effect. that is um, quite a good theory, actually. See, if it was a U-boat, mm. it would make sense to um, shore up somewhere deep until they gave up, basically, because they couldn't find it anymore, and then wait till all the boats are gotten and then sail out of the southern tip. <laughs> Quite a risky than... business because even though this is quite a big field, you know, uh, a field what, about 150 miles. I mean, that's still a it's still an enclosed space for a U boat to be, and I would imagine they would have found it relatively quickly. Yeah, you know, uh, there's not too many places they they would know the search area, which would be the field itself, and if they deployed uh, 30 ships, they could they could scan that pretty damn quickly. Back in 1972. Yeah, not, Technology's not, not the same. Uh, yeah, but, not now. Uh, I don't know. I just, the problem I have, I said it at the beginning of this account, is the ifs, spends, mys and maybes, and no yeah. definite no definite information on this. It's a, it's, a, it's a good tale. It's a good yarn. You know, again, it's, it's a good tale, isn't it? And if it did happen, the, you know, the information... To back this up, it's all going to be secret and red acted the heck out of probably mm. by the time it ever yeah. gets released. It'll be interesting to see um, if Norway ever releases the reports of this. If they have, they may well have already done that. But again, it's an if so's, when's, and maybe's account mm-hmm. of unexplo- you know, unidentified witnesses, and the timeline is questionable. What they, uh, it's just. Mm, this is the problem I have. This is the main problem I have with any kind of ufology account. It's yeah. all a lot of ifs, whens, and maybes. The Shack Harbour is a slightly different case in question because you have got named witnesses. Do you know what I mean? And you, there are conventions that you can go and talk to these people and stuff yeah. like that. But with when it comes to military involvement, you're not going to get those kind of answers because it's cloaked in mili- you know um, the Official Secrets Act isn't it? And this is well, the main yeah. problem for this. And these kind of things would come under national security because if it is an unidentified object, from whether it be from another country or from outer space, you know yeah. what I mean? It is going to come under national security. Yeah, and the last thing a country wants to admit is they have something in its uh, waters or in its skies that they can't account for. Exactly, because... That's basically, I mean, we've got a gap in our security somewhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and they're going to cover it up and, you know, yeah, cover it up, basically, and not give out the relevant information to follow it up. It's crazy. But people still go and, you know, go to the Ford and mm. try and find out more information than they can. And, you know, it's one of those, isn't it? Now, let's go to Mongolia. Let's... Oh, go on, you're paying we're going yeah. to Lake Bacal okay. in 1982. We're going to get into our little time machine and pop over to Siberia. Yep. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the musical accompaniment. Mm-hmm. Now, this is the yeah. largest... No, that, that was the controls making us go forward in time. <laughs> <laughs> we're in the largest fresh body of water in the world. It's a 300 million year old lake. Um, it's got its own, like... Flora and fauna, it's got its own little ecosystem going on in this lake. It's, but they reckon it holds 20% of the planet's fresh water. That's a lot. That's a heck of a lot. Now, a guy called Vladimir Azazazar. 
<laughs> okay. Oh my god. He's a, apparently he's an famed ufologist and a former Soviet naval officer. Declassified secret files. Love that. Released by the Russian government that indicated indicated. Oh, well, there's the key word there. It indicated yeah. that in 1982, seven military divers were training in the depths of the Baikal when they spied bizarrely shaped underwater vehicles that moved far faster than any technology the, the Soviet Navy had at that time. Mm-hmm. Right? The divers also claimed, oh dear, that they came across a squad of silver suit clad, clearly non-humans, at a depth of about 150 feet. Now, right. These are Russians... They tried to capture some of these humanoids, which actually resulted in the death of three of the divers. Four of the survivors talked about their encounter and their experience and were said to have been severely injured. Now, they came up too quick. They got the bends. Ah, the dreaded bends. Right. Now, the bends is notorious. You have to then go into a decompression chamber if you get the bends, right? So something happened yeah, yeah. under the water that's caused the death of three of them and four of them to come up too quickly. These, Although they're training, that's a basic training. They would have had that bit of training before mm. anything about oh, having yeah. to come up from a depth to avoid having the bends. But they took the risk and came up quickly because of the experience they had and the fact they were actually injured. They only had one decompression chamber and the four people were put inside of that. Yeah, uh, certainly. Yeah, a diver will only do a quicker ascent. Is it? Yeah, upwards ascent. Yeah, if it's an emergency, and uh, that is a you know you've got to have a decompression chamber pretty close by. That's about all we know about that particular mm. case because although their records were released, they're they're re- redacted to the point of incoherency. So this is the problem we have with this particular case, is that although those files were released, they were redacted so badly that we can only get basics out of that. We don't know what happened. It could be an accident, which we've seen. Unfortunately, you know, we have seen these kind of accidents happen where it's absolutely tragic. People are trapped underneath. I remember a submarine that got trapped and they couldn't get the guys out. Um, Mm -hmm. That wasn't so long ago, Um, you know mining disasters yeah. we we see it we have seen it so whether or not that was just a tragic training accident we don't know and in the in the hallucinations they were having because of getting the bends they've this story has come out and uh, who knows but there were some recent photographs that were released by nasa that may help to confirm that lake bauhau does conceal something unexplainable oh now, two astronauts in 2009 and the International Space Station actually photographed two enigmatic circular convection breaks which appeared to have been created by something rising up from below the ice covering Lake Barkal. Right. However, my argument on this one is nature will create circular turning ice plates, yeah. ice plates basically it's yeah. to do with current yeah. and the way the ice fractures and it creates a perfect circle and it's not common it's quite unusual it's a sight to see if you go and look on the internet you'll be able to see it it is a natural phenomena and this could mm-hmm. be what this they've seen what looks like something raising up from below the ice could be the current creating these circular sources shapes yeah because I suppose, yeah, if it fractures they, and it they starts... Get them, they get them on the lakes in Canada. Yeah. yeah. Yes. You can see them on YouTube. Mm-hmm. If you yeah. That's it. So we do know that there is a natural phenomena of the earth, or, you know, I say the earth, nature, creating these kind of circles. But these ones are approximately three miles in diameter. That's big. Which is big. Oh, it's a big lake. But it is a big lake. Yeah. Mm. And yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. You don't know what the currents are like in it. I mean, it, yeah. And if it's got its own ecosystem, it seems to it will probably generate its own sort of weather as well around the lake above it. 
beneath it. Mm. So yeah, you don't know quite what's going on. Yeah, it is very. It is very. Um, again, it's one of those, isn't it? A good yarn, a good tale. We can't really back it up with evidence or witnesses or information. It's all very. You know, this is supposed to have happened. The documents are redacted. It's a nightmare. It's again military. So you you coming across that problem all the time with these um, and the ufology camp does try to establish some kind of proof of the account of both of those the two accounts we've we've come across but with all kinds of as i say when it comes to to state security particularly russian i mean come on and it's yeah. A bit naive of some of the investigators. I know they go out and they say, "Oh, the military are holding this back for us," but but the military have secrets, you know. They, you know, which are probably not for us to know about. You know, I mean, what's the point of having the military if they can't keep some certain um, information and to themselves? I think if we knew the full extent of everything that ever, ever goes on, like politically, and and which is mm. what drives these situations at the end of the day, isn't it? Political politics. Yeah. I think we would be terrified, absolutely terrified. And we'd be like, yeah, you know, you can't... Well, that's it. I mean, as, as I've said in, in other um, conversations, you know, we elect these politicians or the, the prime minister or the presidents of, of the world or whatever um, to, to make these decisions for us on our behalf. Mm. So we don't need to be in, you know, in, uh, you know, we we don't need to be in the in the conversations with all the full facts. We we just need to do what they tell us because, at the end of the day, we appointed them in that job role to make the decisions for us. Mm. Mm. Well, in a demo- you know, in a democratic a- society, yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, and so yeah, we just got to put up and shut up. I think, but the, I think but the you're mili- right. I think yeah, you are but, right. But the, I mean, the military hmm. are, um, you know, that side of things. I think people would be actually really shocked to see yeah. how often we've avoided warfare because of some of yeah. these situations that have happened. You know, I mean, there's a very oh, fine so- line, isn't there? Of of telling everybody what's going on, like so that's total transparency. I'm going to tell you everything about everything, and then let yeah. you know, and then hope that you trust that you know you're not. That doesn't happen. Not me no. money. If they told us everything about everything, for one, the, the main person on the street isn't really going to understand the subtleties and the the political manoeuvring that goes on. I mean, I no. I'm not political minded at all, and sometimes I really wonder what they're thinking of. It's, it's such all you've a got to do arena. is just all you've got to do is just think of it as a game of chess. Yeah, I'm very good at that. You know, you play the game of chess, you make the moves. You don't explain to other people what moves you're making and why. Exactly. Yeah, you don't explain what your no. end goal is. And plus, uh, particularly sort of like here in the UK, US, and other sort of like and democratic countries, the military is not a democracy. No. No. <laughs> and let's get that straight. <laughs> yeah. It's one of those, isn't it? You you elect a leader to hopefully do the best for the country as a whole. That may be in direct um direct conflict with you personally, but for the country you hope yeah. they make the best decisions on as a whole to keep the country going, to keep the country working and keep the economy mm. right and you keep you trust that they're doing that because they know more than we will ever know. And to mm-hmm. be fair, too many cooks spoil the broth, quite frankly. Well, yeah. yeah. Do you know what I mean? Somebody's got to make a decision somewhere. If every single decision was put out for a democratic vote, we'd never make any bloody decision. And on that no. note, we're going to take a quick break. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Harry Price here. If there's nothing me and my friends enjoy more here on the other side, it is to sit back and relax and listen to the Paranormal Concept Show right here on the PAUK Radio Network. Broadcasting a plethora of interesting and informative content for all your paranormal needs. Find them across social media to keep up to date with forthcoming shows and all their other adventures. Hello, is there anybody there? 
And welcome back to the Paranormal Concept Show, exclusive to the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Now, I got a bit bored with you, so after all of that. <laughs> uh, there weren't enough um, information for me, to be fair. I was getting a bit frustrated because I like details. Um, I, I can't deny. I like a detail. And uh, this is the problem I have with ufology. You don't get the details. So I then moved on to archaeology, basically, because there's lots of other things anomalous under the sea other than USOs. Um, strange structures are found. Various things are found. And um, I find them more interesting in some ways than um, the USO accounts. So we mm-hmm. thought we'd, we'd go into um, this side of things because there has been some very interesting remains or, you know, city, what they think are city remains under the sea. And uh, so we thought we'd take a little look at that. We did. Is that it? Yep. That's yeah, it. that was quick, wasn't <laughs> it? <Right>, okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, the boys aren't as into this as I am. Everybody, <laughs> they're like, "Oh, this bit's the boring bit. No, we, there, we like our <laughs> usos." <laughs> no, there, there was a remain of what they think is a six thousand year old city immersed deep underwater off the west coast of Cuba, yeah. and it was discovered by a team of Canadian and Cuban researchers. Um, I'll get Kerry to tell you what their names are. <laughs> what, the you. offshore engineer? Yeah, yeah. Them ones. <laughs> okay, yeah. so I apologise if anybody listens to this and relates to this name, <laughs> name pronunciations. Paulina Zaletsky well, and her husband, Paul Weinsweig, and her son, Ernesto Tapanis. Tapanis? I, yeah. I think it would be Paul Weinsweig. Weinsvig. Yeah, because he mm-hmm. said it's German and German pronounces their W's as V's. Oh, wow. However, but bless them. These are offshore engineers and they use sophisticated sonar and videotape devices to find some megaliths. Like megaliths, the kind of things you'd find on Stonehenge or Easter Island. That sort of thing they found. And they say yeah. that some of the structures within the complex may be as long as 400 metres wide and as high as 40 metres, sort of sitting on top of each other. So they're very distinct shapes and symmetrical designs. And they don't they say that this is not natural. This is something that's been made. How they made it, we go back to, how? How did they do that? <laughs> but, yeah. Now, they've showed them to plenty of scientists in Cuba and America and loads of other people have shown lots of interest in this and nobody has ever suggested that they are natural. It's very, very interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's one of those things, you know, uh, I've, I've actually sort of seen the sonar images of these uh, structures. They're, they're quite available out there and it was quite a big story when it actually sort of hit, I believe, in the uh, 1990s at some point and uh, uh, the images themselves are very compelling you can actually sort of usually when they show sonar it, uh, images they need someone to interpret them you know they say oh this is this and that's that but these you know and even for a lay person you can actually sort of see what are well pyramids basically mm. you know and uh yeah, and uh, straight edges, which I believe is quite unusual for sort of uh, nature, as we sort of touched upon in the first segment with the ice circles and stuff like that. And if that forms anything sort of natural, they tend to be circular, whereas uh, mm. most archaeologists will actually say that if you come across straight lines, I mean, that is man-made. So there's That's a lot it. of evidence uh, suggesting that uh, these are man-made structures. There are some rocks mm. that will um, split in mm. straight lines. Sandstone's very known for that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, certain granites and marbles will split in a straight line, but very rarely mm. in right angles. Well, I think that that's more about how the, the stone had formed. So, so geologists would know that. Um, yeah. An anthropologist affiliated with the Cuban Academy of Sciences said that the still photographs um, that were taken of this object under the water um, and was from videotape, and it clearly shows symbols and inscriptions. That would make sense, though, wouldn't it, if it is a yeah. man-made structure? If you think of, like, the Aztec 
um, structures. They've all got um, symbols well, yeah, and, and stuff. Well, yeah, and the Egyptians yeah. as well, you know. And Yeah, the hieroglyphs, yeah. But Mr. Weinsvig said that it's not known in what language the inscriptions are written. So they're still yet to identify them on this between uh, now and you know when the show goes out, sort of thing. They've discovered it. Yeah, <laughs> I don't I know. That's a short window of time, but it's yeah. very interesting. I mean, because of the locale, you know, you it does the suggestion would be either Mayan or Aztec because uh, Cuba is not that far from and sort of like uh, Mexico, you know, and there and it is sort of known that uh, Cuba was actually joined to the land, to the main well, continental uh, US at, at some point. So, you know, you've got that. You know, yeah, so I mean, it's not... not that great leap of sort of faith to say no, that's that it. And they it were building. It could be a combination of the two, Mayans and Aztecs, because that's not unknown either, because the Jesuits, um, when they came over to the Americas, they, I, I think it was the... As Tex, it might have actually been the Mayans, to be fair. Um, mm-hmm. They sort of cross-contaminated each other, and yeah. they took symbols from the Mayans or the Aztecs, and and they fiddled about with it and changed it to their own. Oh. So it's not unknown that that happens. And I, I don't, I mean, how far? I mean, Cuba and Peru are they quite close together? I mean, my geography of the Americas is rubbish. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, they are quite far. Yeah, and Cuba's on. I mean, and Peru's more or less. Well, it is on the uh, west coast of uh, South America, so yeah, it's very far. <laughs> okay, I was gonna say even like the uh, Mount of Picchu, mm-hmm. or whatever. They could have had the same do it, but obviously not. In that place. I don't know, though, where you've got a continent and it does, although you have variations across the continent, it's there are similarities, aren't there? Yeah, but I think the thing going for this is we know, we know for a fact there are megalithic uh, structures and uh, periods and stuff in South America. Mm Mm-hmm. This is known. You can go and see them, you know. So, and and this and Cuba is on that side. There may have been a land bridge, and they're pretty much sure that sure that Cuba was connected to the mainland so you know it is pointing towards if it is this sort of big big structures that they would be Mayan or Aztec Mm. in origin Mm. but they've got to still do a lot of work on this and they're looking to go and do a first deep water mobile excavation Mm -hmm. like um, using something you know sand blasters and oh god knows what else they use underwater so they can actually get better photographic images of this and you know start doing the archaeological work i mean it's bad enough mm. doing archaeological work on land but you imagine trying to do that under the sea you know it's a, whole... well, it's a specialized job you yeah know, you get underwater archaeologists you know I, that's I love, what you're trying to do i love how you just missed that word i know I'm, I'm jumping <laughs> words beautifully tonight i know yeah yeah <laughs> right i will say it they plan to foray to the site, which is off the Guanahana Cababababas Peninsula, on the Cuba's western tip. <laughs> Guana Harkabibes. Guana Harkabibes yeah, Peninsula. I just had to pull you back to that one. I know, I know you're <laughs> going to do this. I know, the whole time I was looking at this, I was thinking, I know exactly how this show is going to go. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> I, just, I just see that word in the research and I thought, oh, I was so going to look forward to Kerry saying it's got more letters in the alphabet, that one. And then you totally jumped it and I was like, no, hang on a minute. I'm not happening. <laughs> not my show, I don't know if I can imagine that. No, that's it. <laughs> oh, dear. Me do try me, don't oh, you? Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Bless you. Now, oh, anyway. The structures are on a plateau that form the bottom of what is thought to be a mud volcano 650 to 700 metres beneath the surface of the ocean and along what is clearly a geological fault line. So it is well known that ancient civilizations like to build at the base of volcanoes. The land is very fertile. Mm-hmm. Um, so who knows what happened? I mean, you know, you can go down into theories of... I don't know, earthquakes, fault lines, land dropping off into the ocean, massive tsunamis, you can go down that route all you like. But until they get back down there and start really examining this, there's not a lot more we can um, know 
about this, but... Well, that's it. It keeps them warm as well. This has been known about for some while, and uh, I'm surprised, you know, I often sort of keep my ear to the floor, sort of, like, internet-wise, but there's they don't seem to be sort of... It was a big story at the time, and then it sort of just seemed to sort of fade out, and it's sort of just there as a, a footnote now, you know, so whether they are going to go back, I hope they do. Uh, the only See, sort were, of... Were these... Sorry, Sorry yeah... Just... The only sort of thing this sort of has slightly going against it is the depth it's at and uh, sort of like looking at sort of uh, sea level rises because that's what you're looking at, that this was once dry land, the sea sort of rise rose at the end of the last ice age, but 700 metres is very deep. It is very deep. I mean, it's, and, that that uh, raises that... its own problem, particularly at this mm. moment in time. Um, it's trying to get funding for anything, isn't it? And the mm-hmm. funding that this is going to call or going to need is going to be something extraordinary. And at this moment in time, I don't know whether that's caused yeah, a knock-on think, effect. And you know, yeah, yeah, but yeah, seven hundred meters. Uh, yeah, it's certainly out of the reach of conventional light like, divers and stuff like that. So it'd have to be quite a remote operation, I should imagine. Which uh, you're talking mega bucks. Or something like that. Exactly. So, <laughs> could it be Atlantis? <laughs> that, that, that word had to crop up, didn't Of it? course it oh, did. We Atlantis couldn't talk about is... legendary sunken continents without <laughs> actually bringing up Atlantis. We're not going to go into it. We just like to uh, add. Atlantis, no. Atlantis is over by Spain. That's what you <laughs> think. Yeah, oh, that, is that, Hercules that... and... Or whatever it was, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, did it exist? I mean, Atlantis always crops up whenever sort of uh, underwater structures are found. That uh, always crops up. But it's quite interesting to note here that uh, Mr. Wigstein, whatever his name is, I mean, he, you know, he's quite keen to avoid that because of the stigma that's attached to that. You go to any, because he's got to get funding to do this. Mm-hmm. And if he goes to a unit, you know, sort of like a government agency, I don't know quite where they get the funding from but i think it's sort of uh, educational uh, institutions and you think i think i found atlantis will you give me the money to go and research it they're saying yeah on your bike <laughs> exactly but ancient civilizations might yeah. give them a bit more chance at yeah. funding if you can yeah you can give them a good sort of case and show your your data and uh, everything yeah and uh, if it's something that they think is viable and uh, will you know sort of further our knowledge of the past yes they would be more more sort of like uh, appreciative of a approach like that I mean what is interesting is on land they have actually excavated in 1966 a megalithic structure on the western coast that's actually quite close to the underwater discovery now mm-hmm. that was said to date from 4000 BC so their base so that's why they reckon it could be 6 6000 years old because they're basing it on that and other geological information yeah. they've got in that area now if that estimate proves accurate it would mean that ancient civilizations had designed and erected in huge, vast stone structures in the Americas, 500 years, only 500 years, after human settlements first became organised in cities and states. That's a feat. Uh, that is a feat, and I think that's possibly why they may not be getting funding, you know, because uh, the academic community are quite set in their ways and uh, they don't like the apple cart being rocked, <laughs> you know, even when they are presented with stuff like this because they can possibly look at the data sort of, and they can sort of go to their books and their academic sort of, uh, sort of pursuits or whatever they do and they say, well, no, it can't exist because it, it just simply, you know, I mean, this is one of the problems with sort of uh, uh, um, academia. Mm. Uh, They are quite set in their ways. Well, particularly as, like, it would suggest that it's been built way before the wheel was invented Mm -hmm. or sundials in Egypt or even the Three Pyramids on Giza. So when you start Um, looking at it, they're able to do mm -hmm. that then and then they did that. You know what I mean? It's like it throws that timeline into question, doesn't it? You would have to rewrite the history. There, there is a place in Spain um, that's been excavated, and I believe it's called Dun, uh, Donana. 
and it's in the National Park in Spain that's um, being archaeologically dug out, and they believe that that was Atlantis. Right. Yeah. Well, I do know the uh, I do know the site you're talking about that has sort of like come to fall sort of relatively recently. Yeah. There was yeah. Big, he's, yeah. He's, he's there was a sport. big national G. Uh, National Geographic showed a lot of interest in it, and I think they sort of sponsored you know, a film crew and a partial sort of, and as you say, a, a sort of like dig and stuff. Yeah, I think that was more I, for Yeah, doc- I've just looked it up. That's how I got that information. Mm. Mm-hmm. The problem but, is um, with the Atlanta, it only comes from Plato. And, um, well, that's it, yeah, the Pillars of Hercules, wasn't it? And, exactly, uh, yeah. but he was and, a playwright. He, was, he told, like, um, tales of... Um, you know, teaching tales, basically. Morality tales, that's the word yeah. I'm searching for. And so whether or not it ever did exist is questionable because that's the the first source we've got of Atlantis. It sparks the imagination mm. beautifully, but whether or not it really did exist is one of the age-old questions, isn't it? But, oh. you know, it, unfortunately, that's that's the situation with Atlantis, but we are finding these underwater alleged structures. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use the word structures um, that are incredibly interesting, but I really would. I'm I'm like, I'm with the guy on this one, Mr. Weinsberg or whatever his name was um, to Weinsweig really caution on use, associating that word with this find. I would, I'm with him on this one because Unfortunately, Atlantis does. Yeah, it's one of them, isn't it? I mean, we've talked about this. We've done a show on the lost city of Atlantis. And there's so much you could look at with it. It was a fascinating mm. show. It was a bit like a tennis match um, between <laughs> myself and Paul on that one. Um, it was, oh, hello, the hellhound has arisen. <laughs> the crack in the wakes. <laughs> Will he give us his own personal take on Atlantis is the question. <laughs> Um, whatever it is, this this particular find is incredibly interesting. You know, whenever they go back, it, it must be so challenging to try to find, um, you know, to, to get it sorted um, and dug out and looked at properly um, mm-hmm. for that, you know, for that depth and funding that they must need. It must be so challenging. I mean, we think our day-to-day jobs are challenging. This must be incredibly challenging. <laughs> you think you've found an absolutely amazing find, and then you've got to try and find the money to actually do something with it. But, yeah. you know, they think it could be several kilometres um, in size, which is enormous. But Which is a big complex if it is indeed uh, sort of a man-made sort of complex. I mean, and uh, the sort of... Uh, and. You know, and if it is, and if and if they can prove it, I mean, this sort of, you know, it, it is quite an earth-shattering sort of moment. I mean, you know, you do have to rewrite history. You do, you do, and the area, what they need to do, right? Because that whole area is renowned for sunken Spanish galleons, right? Now, these yeah. are the, the famed treasure-bearing ships that are supposed to be like, you know, dead. great. If they could find on Spanish galleons with real treasure on it, that would fund their research for this particular project. So, fingers crossed, they do. Uh, yeah, I, there are a lot of people out there that actually do make a living from actually doing that, funny enough. There's one particular famous treasure hunter that does it, and uh, he's made an absolute fortune. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. Um, so... Japan. Let's go to Japan, everybody. Uh, if you don't, the land of the rising sun. Again, a lot of, you know, we know a lot about Japan. I'm gonna, I know at some point I'm going to say Japanese. No, Japanish. That's how I normally say it, Japanish. Old Japanish. <laughs> Good old Japanish. Now, there is a sunken city um, that they reckon was sunk about 2,000 years ago. That's the belief Masaki Kimura, who's a marine geologist at the University of Ryukyus in Japan. Now, he's been diving to this site to measure and map its formations for more than 15 years. Now, he's convinced that the city, or this this place, is a 5,000-year-old city. And again, it looks complicated, monolithic, steeped pyramids that rise from a depth of 25 metres, which is 82 mm-hmm. feet. Um Mm-hmm. But 
<laughs> controversy really does come in amongst all of this, doesn't it? Well, yeah, of course it does. I've actually sort of like seen photos of this structure. I mean, and it is quite well visited because it is within the reach of uh, normal divers. You can actually go and dive this site and loads of people have been there. You know, it is the go-to site. I mean, and it does look impressive. Uh, when you're talking about sort of, uh, you know, straight lines and right angles and stuff like that, it is quite impressive. But, again, uh, there's this has sort of split the scientific community. Yeah, it certainly has. Um, <laughs> now, he's convinced that they're all natural. Again, they're all natural. Now, this is a guy called Robert Shosh. Um, who's a, he's a professor of science and mathematics. I would never be able to say that without laughing. Um, who has actually dived at this particular site. Now, um, he says it's basic geology and classic stratigraphy of sandstones, which tend to break along planes and give you the straight edges and well, blah, yeah. blah, 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 right? That's what he says. He says um, it's completely natural. That's what he thinks. He doesn't think it's man-made at all. But... They've got to carry out a lot more work on this. This is another area where they've got to do the work on it. Because, mm -hmm. you know, even if it is natural, then that throws up a lot of questions about geology, doesn't it? Well, of course it does. It does. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, I mean, with sandstone, it's... Again, we're, we're talking about a 5,000-year-old structure... Well, a, we'll say structure, but um, the levels of the sea would have been different. Mm-hmm. So, although it could wall, wear away one part, as it rises, it wear away further up. So, it depends on how much it sank each time, I would have thought. Yeah, to the... To create uh, the flat surfaces. I've, I've sort of like, and as I said, I've been looking at photos of this sort of structure. The only thing that could suggest that it is natural as opposed to sort of man-made... It does appear to be a solid lump, so to speak, and it doesn't look at all practical in any way. It, there is a lot of right angles and sort of like, you know, sort of sheer sort of cliff sort of stuff that look, you know, that look pretty sort of like polished and stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it, you can't really relate it to anything like unlike the uh, the, the scans of the Cuban anomaly where you look at them and you can actually sort of see a pyramid and we all know what a pyramid is and we sort of roughly know what they were for you know sort of ceremonial structures and stuff like that but this is basically just a big lump of rock see but then if, which... if it was current based that caused it mm -hmm. then surely using the same logic um the grand canyon would all be or some of the Grand Canyon would at least be similar. Because that was uh, by currents, wasn't it? Yeah, I wouldn't... You know, well, that's, you're talking about sort of like the geology. I, I, I don't particularly know. I should imagine the Grand Canyon is uh, sort of like a, a sandstone-based uh, sort of uh, canyon, which would erode rather quickly. Yeah, but then they're, they're that's saying, what they're saying. If they're it's saying sandstone, Japanese, in the yeah. Japanese oh, right. government, they're, they're saying that it's sandstone. Yeah. So it'd be a bit similar. I mean, okay, it might have a different content, but they're this, technically the same stone, almost. Well, yeah. So it should be like, like, like for like, but it's not. So, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Without having, having a look myself, it'd be difficult to like, examine it. Yeah. Well, I will be sharing articles to this, well, photos of this on the page for when the show goes up, so people can actually go and have a look for themselves. I think the problem with this one is that, I mean, you've got two different, like, um, ecological factors haven't you? you've got something like the grand canyon which is a you know obviously above mm -hmm. ground and it's you know mm. it's wind and erosion you know water wind and water erosion whereas under the <coughs> sea it's just water um mm -hmm. and tide it's not the same um forces at play the rock will act differently and erode differently yeah. under those different circumstances now i believe 
that the Grand Canyon is, although it has sandstone, it also has um, a lot of limestone in it. It's a metamorphic rock, um, mm-hmm. which sandstone, I believe, is more sedimentary. I could be wrong on that. Um, mm-hmm. But until they do more testing on it, we'll never know. But there is a yeah. tale. There is a tale um, surrounding this. Now, some people believe that the structures could be left of a civilization called Mu. Right now, I've talked about Mu before now, and this links into, and this is really weird, right? The Lemurian cultures of uh, cultures of South America. Yes, I've heard about the uh, civilization of uh, Mu. That's the that's the one in the Pacific, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Now, they were rumoured to have vanished beneath the waves. Now, we have this tale time and time again coming up in, you know, cultural, folklore, history, mythology, whatever title we want to put on it, of an ancient civilization well advanced above its time that disappears beneath the waves. And, you know, this is like we've now got three three possibilities of ancient cities that have disappeared beneath the waves. Now, we do know... Back in, like, the Mesopotamian times, it was a time of massive volcanic activity in the Mediterranean area. There's nothing to say Mm. that wasn't going on elsewhere in the world as well. So, you know, when you look at the formation of the Earth, this was a very volatile time in that that particular period of thousands of years. Um, There's nothing to say that that wouldn't have happened, that these civilizations did exist and did, I don't know, thanks to some geological fault movement and volcanic activity, ended up beneath the sea. Mm. You know, we do know that the sea was 100 metres lower than it is today. That's just how it's gone through ice mm-hmm. ages and stuff. That's a vast difference, though, from the depths that these places are talking about. But then if you've got seismic movement that has dropped away, yeah. there's nothing to say that it didn't. Whether or not yeah. it would be that huge expanse of land that would have just dropped, I don't know. I wasn't there. I know it's strange. I know everyone thinks I'm not ancient. <laughs> but, you know, I wasn't there to see it. It's a possibility. But, a lot of how this this world has formed is still questionable, isn't yeah. it? I mean, we're still... There's, they think now that they've located the crater from the extinction event for the dinosaurs but yeah that's a theory oh, i still don't know do you know what i mean I, I think the only sort of going along those lines with the geological sort of like uh, disaster or catastrophe that actually caused it i mean where this is situated is on the pacific rim which is notorious you know the the mm. And the Ring of Fire, I mean, it sort of like encompasses the whole of the Pacific from uh, sort of up from like Russia all the way down through the archipelagos of uh, Indonesia and stuff and uh, around New Zealand and then up the South American side. So this is a volatile area. It is an incredibly volatile. Well, all of it, I was going to say, you know, when you go back to the time period they're talking about, we know geologically it was very volatile. We know Mm -hmm. this, you know. Um, now, rather than having what we'll say is, you know, like um, symbols and stuff, that he does say that he's identified quarry marks in the stones and he says that rudimentary characters are etched onto carved faces like, like animals. Mm-hmm. Which does kind of then put a different spin on it, but without photographic proof or without... Further excavation. I mean, it is an actual dive site. You could go and dive on this site. It's an open dive site. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, and, they, you know, everyone sort of like, uh, you know, it's usually the first stop for anyone interested in sort of like Atlantis and sort of those sorts of stories because it is very mm. accessible. It is. So, so then the more people that dive on it, the more maybe the more answers we'll get because they'll photograph different areas of it and what whatnot. I mean, they... Mm-hmm. There is even supposed to be an underwater sphinx, um, which actually remembers a Chinese or Okinawan king mm-hmm. um, that's under there. As I say, I've not actually seen any photographs of this. Um, I think this is the thing you'll find. I When I was looking at the research earlier and I sort of went online just to fer- familiarise myself with the structure itself and uh, 
again, his sort of uh, story of uh, hieroglyphs or sort of uh, markings and stuff, they're very anecdotal. There's there's no photographic evidence to actually back them up, mm. which makes you sort of wonder, is he sort of uh, mm. a bit of wishful thinking? You know, because if you want to uh, sort of say this, you've got to have the evidence. And considering this site, it's filmed, it's photographed, it's very well documented. Mm. Very well documented, and nothing's ever come to light along those lines. No, absolutely. Who knows? It's an interesting, it's fascinating. But I think when we've looked at all of this underwater malarkey, you know, from the USO side of it, I think, you know, we've, <laughs> we've looked deep under the ocean quite in a few different ways now from, you know, ancient animal tales and folklore of the ancient mariners and, you know, we've done new size, we've looked into that area and we've looked into, you know, the archaeological side of things. It always never ceases to, to surprise me what is found, you know, what they do achieve. I mean, they never thought they'd find the Titanic and they did, thanks to James oh, Cameron. Yeah. Thanks to James Cameron mainly for putting the money up for that one. Um, you know, but... They found it. They they yeah. worked out why it sank so easily as it did now, which they didn't back then. It was the unsinkable ship. It did. They found it. it. Was all, even I can remember really young, you know, I had a fascination with the Titanic, and this was before it was discovered. And you know, and I can remember this was the big quest of its age, yeah. you know, to find the wreck of the Titanic. It was unfindable, you know, but then it just like it was came. unsinkable. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So, and I think you know, under the sea, it's just out of reach for most of us, isn't it? And it does fire the imagination, doesn't it? It does. It does. And you know, there, there was. Um, the, I think the best movie they ever made of it was um, A Night to Remember. It was called. Um, that was absolutely amazing film, and it's a black and white one. But they, they even. Once they found the wreck of the Titanic, they made Titanic 2, and it was Raise the Titanic. They actually oh, made right, a yeah. film mm. about raising it up. Mm. So here's an ethical yeah, question the then. There's an ethical question. Do you think they should? Well, raise the Titanic? I don't think they can. <laughs> if they could. I, no, I don't, if, if I they don't think they can. No, they can't. Um, no, I think it's too far gone now. Yeah, yeah, it's too far to be um, right. But I think because of so many, the, the fact that so many people died on the ship, they should leave it as a shrine, almost. Yeah. Well, it's decaying alone. all the time. I mean, about 100 years' time, they reckon it won't be sort of like there. And, uh, yeah, just leave it be. We've found it, and uh, we it's been very well documented now. Again, we know... The, you know, photographed, uh, the, there's models of it lying on the seabed and stuff. We've done all we can. We've found out what we more or less need to know and just let it be. They've also, yeah, they have absolutely. recovered a hell of a lot. You go to the Titanic exhibition, oh, yeah. they have actually brought up quite a lot of what they can, haven't they? You yeah, know. and to be fair, there's, there's even a lot of stuff on land to do with the Titanic. Yeah. You don't have to go to the wreck just to get something from the Titanic. No. You know, there's, there's people that had, used to have, like, have tickets and didn't actually make mm. the ship, you know, so there are tickets of the White Star Line Titanic out there. There's loads of merchandise they had with it as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you see it all the time on these but I, think, I think one of the saving graces for the Titanic, where it is now, is it is so inaccessible and uh, to go there you need sort of you know it's sort of like a bit of a, a millionaire's sort of playground isn't it <laughs> really if you want to go down there and visit I mean I know people do I mean but uh, it is quite inaccessible and I think we've got everything we need from it you know they've brought up yeah. a few plates and a few personal effects and stuff like that I mean what else can you do with it I don't know, but it does raise up that ethical question. And then if you look at it in that respect, you know, we've got these alleged, I'll say alleged because, with you know, until they do further archaeology, these, these cities, yeah. you know, who knows what they're going to find. 
And I find that absolutely fascinating. It's hidden by the sea. And we were talking about the tsunami the other day, um, a 2001 tsunami mm-hmm. that happened on Boxing Day. And when the waters receded, um, when they got drawn back before the tsunami hit, because for some reason, the way it happens, it pulls the water out, doesn't it? Yeah, you yeah, get first. the initial break. Well, and as the wave sort of crests as, and as it comes in, it will draw the water in front of it away. So that's so if you're ever at the beach and you see the tide receding really quickly, get run, out, run, run to hike around. Yeah, you know, there's, a, there's a tsunami on the way. <laughs> yeah, get out the way, basically. Get you you sort of see it. You sort of see it at the, at the beaches anyway, because there's the waves come in and then it does draw back yeah it does draw and back, then it yeah. comes back in again and so you is... see it just on a mini level mm-hmm. yeah you do but when they did that in india there's some really famous temples that they know are there and they've, yeah. they've always been underwater but as the the tide pulled back for the tsunami mm. it uncovered these structures and there yeah. was actually a couple of photographs snapped before the water came back in and there's the naivety isn't it of the power of the ocean for the majority of people, it's one mm. of those benign forces that you really don't respect enough. Oh, absolutely, no, yeah. I think a lot of people that um, have accidents in in the sea, they don't respect the water enough, and they so in some some cases they get caught out by it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, very much so. We have it quite yeah. a lot around my area because they un- an underestimate it. That's yeah. That's, Thinking. Yeah, you do have to be careful and treat it with respect. Which we talked about with Nicola White on the mudlarking talk show. You know, yeah. you have to keep one eye on the tides, you know, because oh, it can be particularly, say, particularly where we are on the Thames. I, I actually live right in the estuary, and there's the top when the tide's turning, it's incredibly strong, and you can mm. drift <laughs> so far. Um, one of the kids actually one year um, was out on an inflatable playing around, and the tide turned. And before we knew it, he was over by the pier, which was quite a way away from where we were on the beach. And that was within yeah. five minutes. Yeah, the well, tide yeah. does come in really quick or go well, out. Really quick. And you see why sort of sort of the uh, sort of alternative energy sort of companies are looking at tide power to actually sort of because uh, there there's a lot of potential energy there to harness. Well, they should. To, they should have done yeah. that a long time ago. Mm-hmm. What they've been doing. Going back to governments, what have they been I'm doing? Concentrating <laughs> on what, um, wind turbines. Yeah, they should be doing both. Back. They should have been mm. doing both, in my opinion. But anyway, that's a totally different topic and totally political, and nothing to do with the paranormal yeah. or, or the weird and wonderful that is around. But so many tales come from under the sea that you know it is a very interesting area, and you can go on and on. And when you think about a little human bobbing around on the top of the surface of the water, God knows what is coming out from underneath, you know, what's going on underneath that water. And it is a fascinating, I can understand the fascination of divers, you know, wanting to go and dive and see what they can find under the sea. Um, But it's not something I would ever do. Personally, I don't know about you two, but I, I'm not a diving I'd, kind of girl. I'd love to give it a go. Well, your partner does diving, it doesn't, doesn't he? Yeah, he loves doing diving. Yeah, well, he, he's offered to take you out, hasn't he? Go on, go for it. No. <laughs> not a chance. No, I even went to um, the Caribbean um, with a different partner. <laughs> and um, he was off and I was quite happily paddling around and exploring the sea line rather than going into the sea. I'm not a, I'm not mm. really, I, I'd be on top of it. I've done jet skiing and canoeing and, you know, not kayaking so much, but canoeing I've done amongst the mangroves and stuff like that. I'm much happier on top of it than I am going beneath it. It doesn't really yeah. hold um, much draw for me i'm quite happy to sit on a beach with a book while he goes off diving <laughs> <laughs> he can just come back with underwater pictures for me i'd be happy with that yeah. it, um, would, it would actually be nice to be able to um cut some of it off and just drain the sea in that area just to see what is actually down there well they, you watch. if you look at something like niagara falls where they 
one of the falls they actually um, diverted the water away because um, it was eroding and they needed to see how bad it was eroding because it would affect the flow of water so that you know mm. this is going back into the early 1930s I think it was so they diverted the water away and basically drained part of the Niagara Falls to see and they actually worked out that the shale fall um, was actually helping to support the erosion rather than causing the erosion if you know what i mean and it was mm-hmm. fascinating what they found at the bottom of that they thought that yeah. at least 40 people they reckon had died and they only found about three bodies <laughs> it was really amazing but they found so much stuff underneath yeah. it. they found loads and loads of coins where people would throw coins in for good luck yeah you, nice to see that. You, you get that at bridge it's like the old bridges as well mm. When the Romans used to go over bridges, they threw money in for the uh, Roman gods to say thank you and to let them pass. Yeah, this is why for the sort of like doing the metal detecting and stuff, you do get a lot of Roman coins, especially round rivers, you know. And you sort of, and you can be in the middle of nowhere and you think, well, why am I getting these Roman coins? But you know, they would have forded mm. rivers and whenever they caught could and uh the romans were here for 400 years so uh, they, you know there's a lot of coins dotted around the countryside in the most oddest of places but there's usually a river nearby and there is a very famous town in the uk where a whole treasure train was lost um to the sea and still to this day hasn't been found and people still go out trying to find that and that's in the wash that's so yes. up there isn't it with king john yeah. the first was it yeah, King John. Yes, uh, the wicked old King John. Yeah, he, uh, yeah, he lost his uh, crown jewels in the wash. Yeah. <laughs> Don't they say too... though, what the sea gives, the sea can take? Yeah, I think I think that's something along those lines, isn't it? Yeah, I bet but, Robin Hood uh... had that. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I bet Robin Hood had that. <laughs> Gave that all to the poor, melted it down, yeah. and put it into coinage. Who knows? It's a fascinating, fascinating area, though, the sea. It's just like the mythology that we look at around the sea and, you know, the things that they find, it never ceases to amaze me. Yeah. It is. It's an amazing, um, interesting subject. Fascinating. But on the use of those, like going back to where we started from, I don't know. I don't know if there's any truth to that. I would say probably not. But then I'm not a ufology kind of girl. (coughs) Yeah, I know that. But then it's quite a new um, way of thinking, especially with some of the UFOs that have been um, seen and going into the water or coming out of the water. You know, so it's it's quite a new new thing that's come about. So then uh, we're at the birth of that train of thought so we're not going to have that much research out there yet it's still something that's being looked into and more and more is increasing as the days go on Mm -hmm. so just because we haven't got a lot now saying like in 15 20 years time we just might be inundated with it just as much as we are with the ufos Mm. yeah it's certainly something that is sort of becoming more popular to actually look into because i remember many moons ago when i was a lot younger and sort of you know ufos were all the rage i mean you've never heard anything about usos it's it's certainly it's certainly quite a quite the new kid on the block as regards that part of research it's like you know they're trying to expand their research and uh relate it to ufos you know but whether it's a related of a phenomena who knows i i think it's quite possibly different i don't believe they are related i i, I mean it, it's possible that it's just an extension of the ufo phenomena mm. well yeah but you know at the end of the day it also could also be the government experimenting with new submersible vehicles you know we we don't know in the same way that a lot of the ones they're seeing in the sky could be the same Absolutely. thing, who knows? I mean, it's one of those, isn't it? Who knows? One yeah. thing I have learnt, though, over the last few shows that we've done on this, talking to various people, is that it's a very similar process when you're examining cases um, to do with this. You have to take, if you can, take the alpha case, go back, do the mm-hmm. research, look at external factors. Yeah. You know, you have to not lead the witness, tell them, you know, let them tell their story and work from there, basically. And, you know, I've learnt quite a lot 
um, in regards to like yeah. techniques of how to approach an actual case, which we can take over and should learn lessons yeah. from in the in the paranormal world as much as the ufology world. Yes, I think uh, I was thinking along that that frame of mind, Kerry, that uh, if there's one thing the UFO sort of like research have got going for it, it, it they uh, the people that study UFOs are more pure researchers you know they do research whereas you know whereas the paranormal community has sort of uh, has has come away from that and they sort of more or less sort of go for the the thrill of the chase and uh, stuff like that it seems very detached from research and even though a, par- a, a paranormal sort of person a ghost hunter will call themselves a paranormal investigator there's very little investigating actually going on whereas ufology is quite does have a good foundation mm. in that, and that is still ongoing. Well, there, there are. I mean, to be fair, there are still paranormal investigators that do a really good job. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's just knowing who does that and who doesn't. I mean, I've been in the paranormal for quite a good length of time now, um, and I know plenty of ghost hunting teams but then I know who I need to go to if there is a serious case that I'm investigating. Mm -hmm. Um, And if I am out of my depth or I need extra help, extra bodies, whatever, for the case, then I know exactly who I'm going to. It's exactly the same as if you, you know, so you're on a dive, you find an interesting thing under the sea, you don't know what it is, you'd call other experts in to help you. You know what I mean? Mm. To, To do that to build that body of evidence, as it were, mm-hmm. of what you found under the sea, you know, whether it be a unsubmerged city or whatever it be, you call those experts in to help Absolutely. you. You know, a single dive person is not going to be able to, you know, excavate a 7,000 or, you know, 7,000 square kilometre site, <laughs> you know, all by itself and get the answers and the evidence that's needed and the data that's needed and the, you know, all of that sort of side well, of it. So it's yeah, exactly yeah, the same in the paranormal that. field. I mean, as you know, I like watching that Oak Island thing, right? Mm-hmm. And they do it on there. They're two brothers, they're treasure hunters, but at the same time, they want that they want to get the radio to do the radar sweep of the ground mm-hmm. they've got um seismic experts because mm-hmm. they do the art they put in charges and then blow it up and it takes a radar scan of the ground you know they they employ so much scientific um experts in different fields to try and put the pieces together mm-hmm those brothers are quite fortunate because they are sort of quite wealthy, aren't they? Oh, so, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and they're quite fortunate, you know. It's a, you know, but it just goes to show if if you really do want to get down and, and sort of stuff. I mean, it's going to take, you know, it's it's going to take more than your enthusiasm and stuff. You're going to yeah. need backing, financial backing, which is so, quite difficult to come by. It, there is the difference though in the paranormal because you're not, you're dealing with um you're dealing with a different thing yeah although although the basis is the same for researching and breaking the case down do you know what i mean and calling the right experts at the right timing and stuff like that it's not mm-hmm. as cost heavy as something like that if you know what i mean because you're not dealing no. with actual physical evidence you're dealing with a um a person you know you're looking yeah. at building up a case file of various viewpoints of what could possibly be going on. So, yeah, you might call in, like, a psychologist or a doctor or, a, I don't know, whatever, but you'll you generally find one of those in the field. Mm-hmm. You know yeah. what I mean? If you go back to the infield haunting, that came from the SPR, Maurice Gross and Guy Leon Playfair. You know, they, yeah. they spent hours and hours and hours recording and looking at the phenomena and you know getting it all down and whatnot and the wealth of experience that Guy Leon Playfair brought to that case should not be underestimated he spent a hell of a long time funnily enough in the South Americas researching various kinds of phenomena and belief systems that go on there and there was lots of things that went on that he couldn't explain Mm-hmm. And the research has been done in that way, if you know where to find it. A lot of research in regards to cyclical phenomena has been done if you go 
and look and know where to find it and read the books and look at the people that have done that ancient I say ancient, it's not that old, but, you know, older research, you know, from the, the yeah. early, uh, late 18th, early 19th century. A lot of work has been done and researched and stuff like that. And we need to, you know, bear all these factors in mind if we get a case. And the ufology world, has, as I said, has taught me, taught me that is to look at the yeah. alpha case, break it down, just listen, yeah. just listen, forget your own belief systems and your perspective, just listen <laughs> to what they've got to say. The alpha case is what you're looking at. And yeah, we have a lot of fake and fraud going on out there. They like the most haunted or the um, ghost adventures experience happening in their own very front room. But there is, there is things that happen to everyday people that people can't explain. And you can't always dismiss it out of hand. I learned that lesson when I was totally. looking at the mongoose case. Mm, yes, yeah. the talking mongoose. I was like, why on earth would someone waste their time even thinking about looking at that case? Everybody I spoke to at a conference said they would. The lesson I learned was you don't know until you've, got, until you've researched it whether or not it is genuine phenomena. Mm. You could be dismissing something out of hand because it sounds so bizarre and so crazy, like a 6,000-year-old city based off of Cuba. It sounds so bizarre. but it... Yeah, but then let's face it, right? You know, going back centuries, if someone comes to them at that point and said, oh, yeah, I've just seen, I don't know, the king that died 50,000 years ago walk through my wall, they'd be like, you're a loony, mate. <laughs> No, because you know, they were a lot it, more in touch same. with spirits and ethereal entities than they are now, than we no, are now. But it's, it's the same thing, isn't it? I mean, right now, someone could say to you, oh, I experienced something unexplained, and it, as you said, sounds totally crazy. But you don't know until you've gone to see it with your own eyes. Yeah, true. If you can see and it with your own eyes. And it's the same thing going back in history to the bloke who first saw the, a ghost walk through the wall. Mm. <laughs> you know? Who knows? People who looked at him and thought, Somewhere. You go to Bedlam. To be fair, <laughs> most of the time people do. If you, you know, the everyday person, they like to read a good ghost story. But if you actually say, "Well, it actually happened to me. This is what happened," mm -hmm. they look at you bonkers. My parents think I'm crazy sometimes with some of the tales I relate. That you know, <laughs> going out in the middle of the night in the cold, dark weather to hunt for a ghost that could or may or may not happen is like they're like. Why would you even want to do that? You know, like, why would you want to? Uh, you know, you're the weird one of the, the family. The weird one of the family. And when I talk about conspiracy <laughs> theories and stuff like that, you know, it's all very. It's just sometimes they look at me very bizarrely, but it, that is the world we live in, isn't it? It's all part of the oh, world of we live in, and nobody's immune to a good ghost story, right? Yeah. Oh. Love and in the same way as nobody's immune to the the lure of a treasure ship that sunk off of a you know locating a treasure ship that you know or um the lost city of atlantis we did we touched on that and the the thought that there possibly could be an underwater city that houses gold and treasures and keys to the past is just a lure that's just too tempting it's, it's so yeah, tempting absolutely. i mean you know, you have to believe in it, surely. <laughs> got to believe in something, was, right? Yeah, you've got to believe in something that's just out of reach. I mean, it's what keeps us sane, I think. <laughs> it's that, <laughs> that untouchable dream, isn't it? And then you get a glimpse of it, and that keeps you going. And on that yeah. note, we've actually come to the end of the show. Well, that was a quick... That flew past. It did, didn't it? Yeah, it did. It did. Next it did. week, we're actually heading back onto firm terra firma, and we're going to actually look at some of the structures, the strange and wonderful structures that are found on land, you know, and actually have a look and see whether scientists have been able to explain anything um, to do with the on-land structures. It's hard enough under the sea, but if you've got it on land, is it a bit easier? Tune in next week and you will find out. Say good night, guys. Good night, guys.
Halifax, we know that catching up and checking in on each other has never been more important. So when our customers couldn't come into a Halifax branch, we picked up the phone and gave them a call. In fact, this year we've made over 250,000 wellbeing calls to customers for a natter and a catch-up, just to see if they're doing okay. Halifax, it's a people thing. We are the University of Bedfordshire, where groundbreakers take risks, where future leaders make their mark, where high flyers soar. Get the support and opportunities to achieve more, become more, defy expectations. Find out how a degree at Bedfordshire can change your life. Book now for our open day on November 21st at beds.ac.uk slash defy.